150. Thou art the everlasting word, the Father's only Son, God manifestly seen and heard, and heaven's beloved one, worthy, O Lamb of God, art thou, that every knee to thee should bow. 150. Turn, please, for a short while to the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 4 and verse 2. Chapter 4 and verse 2. And there we read these words In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped 
of Israel. We might well have chosen verse 1 from chapter 11, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Because in one way or another, by means of that phrase, Isaiah is concerned to set before us in this passage none other than the very person of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Now I believe it was a very wonderful word which our Lord Jesus spoke in the early chapters of John's Gospel when he said to his disciples words that go something like this, No man knows the Father but the Son, and no man knows the Son but the Father, and he to whomsoever the Father will reveal him. And in those words he is telling us something like this, that such is the wonder and such is the glory and such is the transcendent nature of the person of God the Father that no one really knows him apart from his dear and only Son. And with that we can gladly acquiesce this morning. And equally, says the Lord Jesus, such are the inherent glories and lovelinesses because when you come across that word loveliness in the Bible, it really is in the plural, lovelinesses, that I may behold the loveliness of the Lord, that I may behold the lovelinesses of the Lord. Such are the inherent beauties, such are the many lovelinesses in the Lord Jesus Christ, that no one really knows him but the Father only. I'm not surprised, said Spurgeon. It's a lovely little uh, quip by Spurgeon on those verses and it tells us again that the Father only, glorious claim, the Son can comprehend. There are such beauties in the person of Christ that only God the Father can really and ultimately know and truly evaluate and truly enjoy those beauties. No man knows the Father but the Son and no man really knows the Son but the Father. I'm not surprised, said Spurgeon. Indeed, as we began our service this morning, we opened that service with that wonderful hymn, Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power that ever mortals knew, that angels ever bore. You can do all of that. You can string them all together, and none of them are worthy to set forth the glories, the beauties, the lovelinesses of the person of our Lord. And so it doesn't surprise us that from beginning to end there are endless names, over a hundred, did you realize that? Over a hundred different names given in Scripture to the person of Christ. And bear in mind that when a name was given in ancient uh, Jewish uh, history and society, when a name was given biblically, it was meant to convey something of the nature, something of the character of that person. And therefore I imagine that of all the names that are given to our Lord, Jesus really has to be the most precious. The Father, we believe, chose them all. But this is the one he was particularly concerned, it seems to me, that men and women should know and recognize, and as far as Joseph and Mary were concerned, should give to him. Thou shalt call his name. You have no option in this, Joseph. You have no option in this, Mary. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, because he is going to save men and women from their sins. But there are over a hundred different names. And so were we to join and string them all together, they are all ultimately, in the last analysis, too mean to speak his worth, too mean to set my Savior forth. So there are endless names given to our Lord in Scripture. There were endless mighty sermons preached by our Lord down here on earth. And could you make a record, Sir John, of all the things that Jesus said and did not all the libraries in the world would be big enough to contain the books and the volumes that should be written. Endless mighty sayings, endless mighty deeds and miracles. And we sing in one of our hymns, endless is the victory. It goes on and on and on. Endless is the victory. Thou or death as one hast won. And therefore this morning, endless should be the praises of this same glorious person. Join all the glorious names. They are too mean to speak his worth, too mean to set my Savior forth. 
And yet, you know, we must attempt to do this, that very thing. What seems to be impossible, we believe we are meant to attempt. And it is nowhere perhaps more eloquently or delightfully attempted than in the pages of the book of the prophet Isaiah. He speaks there in many ways and he uses many different names which he is delighted to ascribe to the person of our Lord. He is, of course, as I have reminded you many times, the great evangelical prophet of the Old Testament. He is truly a prince among prophets and that, of course, for very many reasons. Um, he ministered in the days of some of the greatest kings of Israel, four good, excellent kings in succession, one after the other. He ministered in the southern kingdom of um, Judah, which was the one kingdom that would remain together with Benjamin when the other ten had gone forever into exile in Assyria. He ministered in the very capital of that southern kingdom, in Jerusalem itself. He has much to say about Jerusalem. So he is a great prophet because of the fact that he ministered among great kings, because he ministered in the southern kingdom, because he ministered in the capital of that kingdom, and especially because he has so much to say about the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, and because he seems to delight in ascribing one name after another to that same person. And also, because of the sheer scope of his ministry, he is spoken of by um, uh, scholars as being pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic. In other words, his ministry spans an amazing period of time, infinitely greater than any one mere man in a natural lifetime could span. He speaks of the days before Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in particular went into exile in Babylon. He speaks of the time when they were there in Babylon for 70 years. He speaks also of the time when they will return from Babylon. And he looks down the avenue of time even beyond that to the moment when the Son of God would come into our world. And his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. So he is a remarkable man. He is a remarkable prophet. And indeed he is truly a prince among prophets. So he delights in seeking to call together a number of names, as it were, whereby he may set forth the glory, the wonder, the uniqueness of our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he uh, goes a long way to do just that in the second verse of chapter 4 this morning. In the day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. Now, I have already reminded you of the way in which Isaiah speaks of the importance of Jerusalem in the opening chapters of his prophecy. He speaks of Jerusalem as the ideal, as Jerusalem was meant to be, uh, and is in a sense, or was in the eye and the mind of God from all eternity. A city set on a hill, a city exalted above the hills and the mountains around it, a place of attraction, a place of beauty, a place of loveliness, a place from which the law of the Lord would go forth, a place to which people would come, and in many ways all that was worked out, the ideal. He then sets before them in the opening chapters the reality of the situation, a city given over to idolatry a city doing all the right things in the wrong way and for the wrong reasons, a city burning incense, endless multiplication of sacrifices and so on, all of which God had ordained and ordered. But now the heart has gone out of their faith and the heart has gone out of their worship. And then he looks forward in this chapter, verse 2 and onwards, to Jerusalem the redeemed. In that day shall the branch of the Lord. And that again is one of the remarkable titles given to our Lord, the branch of the Lord, the righteous branch. And he begins that second verse by saying, in that day. Terribly important to try and understand what that phrase actually means. Whenever you're trying to understand a phrase um, in the Bible, always let the context determine the precise nature of the text. In other words, let the verses that come before it, and also to a lesser extent, the verses that come after it, determine what the verse and the phrase itself is actually saying. In that day, 
Now you will find many references to days in one way or another in Isaiah and in the prophets generally. Isaiah, for example, speaks of the last day, or it shall come to pass in the latter days. Now that is as far as the eye can see. It is right down the avenue of time, almost into infinity. As far as the human eye can see, or the prophetic eye can see, and even further, the last day or the latter days. And then again Isaiah speaks of the day, as does um, Amos and Hosea and lots of other prophets. The day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord can mean different things to different people. For the people in the northern kingdom in the days of Amos, they imagined in their vanity and their blindness that the day of the Lord would be a day when God would vindicate them as his people in the eyes of their enemies, the Syrians and the Assyrians. Sadly for them, the day of the Lord came when the Assyrians conquered them and took them into exile. The day of the Lord, it is a day of God's activity whatever that day might be. So I hope this morning that there has been the day of the Lord in your heart and in your life and in your experience. It is the day when God reveals himself. It is the day when God manifests himself. And so we ought to be able to say this morning, yes, there was the day of the Lord in my heart and in my life. It is especially a day of God's activity. And here the phrase, in that day. Now that means this, it is again a day of God's activity, but with special reference to the Messiah and the coming of our Lord. So from chapter 4 onwards, we are now in the realms of prophecy and looking forward to the coming of the Son of God into our world. So here is a verse, which in a sense is all about the Savior and his kingdom. It is all about the king and his kingdom and his subjects. And immediately he is set forth before us, I say, as the branch. Now that is a phrase that is not simply peculiar to um, Isaiah. It is used by Jeremiah. It is also used by the prophet Zechariah. It's a strange sort of phrase. Um, in a sense, it is inadequate to describe our Lord as a branch, or as a root, or as a shoot, or as a stem. But that is the nearest that the English language is able to come to the original Hebrew. A far better translation, in a sense, would have been that growing thing of the Lord which is glorious, the full and ultimate potential of which no one can measure. So it is something that is growing, it is something that is developing, it is something that will get bigger and bigger and more and more glorious and more and more lovely and more and more attractive, in a sense. It is what Daniel saw in exile in Babylon in the second chapter of his prophecy, or rather what Nebuchadnezzar saw and then which Daniel was able to interpret. Nebuchadnezzar saw um, a kingdom developing and then he said, there seemed to be this stone cut out of the mountain, which no human hand had hewn or cut out. And that stone grew larger and larger and finally crushed this earthly human kingdom. Now in a sense, this is what Isaiah is looking forward to. It is that glorious thing of the Lord which is growing and the full beauty and reality and power of which none of us are able to compute or to measure. The Father only glorious plain, the Son can comprehend. But why, we ask, is he called the branch or the stem? Because this is what he is called. Well, I believe for this basic reason that Isaiah is concerned here to bring out all the humanity of our Lord. Wherever you look in Scripture, there is a lovely balance in scripture. Nowhere is scripture going to extremes. There is no polarization in scripture. It sets before us a balance at every stage. So here is a prophet who sings so sweetly of Christ. How does he set him before us? Well as Emmanuel, of course, he is God and he is God with us. 
a virgin shall bring forth a son, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now there, all the divinity, all the deity of our Lord is set forth. But to balance that, it is someone who is going to be also very man, a very man. And so all his humanity must now be traced out to compensate for the divinity, because in that one person there will be two natures, very God of very God, very man of very man. So he is spoken of as a branch, because as a branch he has a root. What is that root? Well, he is from the root of Abraham. He is from the root of Jesse. He is from the root of David. And he will ultimately be from the root of Mary. Divinity is somehow implanted within the womb. And to divinity will be joined now humanity. So he's called the branch because he comes from a root and he has a wonderful and in some cases a strange pedigree. Ruth the Moabitess features in it. Um, Rahab the harlot in Jericho way back features also in it. He is called a branch because he has a root. He is called a branch because he comes from a stock. So he is truly man. He is the seed of the woman which was referred to in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And he displays his humanity. He manifests his humanity down here on earth. I wonder if when you read the Gospels, which aspect of our Lord's person comes um, home to you most clearly? Do you see, for instance, the one who speaks with power and with authority? Clearly God on earth. Do you see the one who is performing and working miracles? Clearly God attesting the person that he is, that his son is. Or do you also see lovely shafts of his humanity? And in his humanity, do you, like Simon Peter, also see shafts of his divinity? There was a moment when the Lord came to Peter and said, um, you've not caught anything. No, no, says Peter, we have been toiling all night and we've taken nothing. Well, now says the Lord, launch out again, cast the net on the other side. But, but master, but master, says Peter, notice he's speaking to the man, but master, we've toiled all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, do as I say, says Jesus. And now they were not able to draw the net for the multitude of fish. And Peter says there's something wonderful here. This is no mere man. This is no mere human master. God is involved here. And Peter says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. O Lord, you see shafts of divinity flash forth from the humanity. But it is for our comfort this morning to see the other way around. Flashes of humanity in the person of Emmanuel. And that is the name that we spoke of last time I was here. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. He is God with us. But he is God with us as a branch that comes out of a stock and develops from a root, Abraham and so on. And it is a great comfort to trace the manifestations and the displays of humanity in our Lord in the Gospels. Of course, he was angry. He slept on the boat crossing the northern shores, uh, eastern shores of Galilee. He slept. He could stand up and rebuke the winds and the waves as God in humanity, but as humanity he slept. He could be angry. He shed tears at the grave of Lazarus. Yes, uh, as someone who was sensitive to other people. And he saw tears, he was surrounded by tears. Mary, Martha, his best friend has died, but he weeps tears also because of this ugly thing called sin which has come into his father's world and marred it and spoiled it and introduced death into it. He can weep, he can rejoice, he can be angry, he can sleep. In the garden of Gethsemane, he is looking for an, an alternative way. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, as the Son, he says, not my will, but thy will be done, O oh, my Father. So you see, it is to stress this other aspect of his person, his humanity. And then as a branch, he draws sap from the root. The Bible tells us that he was nourished by the Virgin Mary. 
Indeed, Luke in his gospel pronounces a blessing upon the very breasts that nourished our Lord. You go home and read it again for yourself. As the, as the, the branch draws sap from the root, so our Lord was nourished. All his humanity is here. She cradled this person in her arms, in her bosom. He grew up. She watched him growing up and so on. And then again, as the branch is the glory of the tree, so our Lord Jesus Christ is the glory, the ultimate of all the pedigree that went before him. There's a phrase in Latin, summum bonum, the supreme good, the highest glory. And as the branch adorns the tree and the trunk and the root, so our Lord adorned all the seed that went before him. In him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. Join all the glorious names, wisdom, love and power. They're all to mean to speak his worth. And the wonderful thing to my mind is this, that in a simple verse like this and a simple phrase like this, Isaiah saw the glories of the Savior, the glories of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he took on board fully the two natures within that person, very God of very God, ah yes, but also very man of very man. And he speaks of the characteristics of our Lord, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, doesn't need to raise his voice and so on. He's of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He doesn't pass judgment because of what he sees or hears, but because of what he knows and so on. The very character of our Lord all displayed there in this human aspect, this human nature, or these two natures of this one person. There is the king. Little word secondly and very hurriedly about his kingdom. Isaiah says, um, well, he is beautiful, he is glorious. The fruit of the earth, that cannot be the fruit of the earth literally because he is speaking of spiritual things and so it has to be spiritual fruit, shall be excellent, shall be excellent and comely. So it is spiritual fruit that is spoken of here and his subjects will be those who will manifest spiritual fruit, gospel fruit. It is a gospel kingdom. He will reap the harvest he has sown. I don't know where this hymn is found, but I remember learning it and singing it. So flowers and flowers will blossom around you wherever you go. So weeds and of weeds reap the harvest. We will reap whatsoever we sow. There it is, it's perfectly scriptural. And our Lord also will reap the harvest he has sown. I do not know how, but he will. I cannot tell, says the hymn, this. I cannot tell that. I do not know how all the nations will bow before him. I do not know how the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. But this I know. He will surely reap the harvest that he has sown. And he has planted a spiritual seed. And he will reap a spiritual harvest. And they are essentially the fruits of his grace and they are the fruits of his work on the cross and they are ultimately the fruits of the spirit and they are ultimately his own character the things that were true of him down here on earth the fruits of the spirit is nothing more than a demonstration of the very nature and character of our lord do you want to know what our lord was like we'll look at the fruits of the spirit love joy peace long-suffering goodness temperance meekness and faith he will reproduce those things those fruits within his people and they shall be excellent and comely a little lighter word for a second. Uh, our little grandson, Ben, has been watching a lot of Toad, of Toad Hall lately. And because he's a bit impish himself, he has taken on board the word that Toad uses a great deal. And it's the word splendid. And the other day, he asked if he could have some peanuts. I said, of course, splendid, he said. Splendid. Now it's a lovely little word, but you don't associate it with a little three or four year old boy. You associate it with someone in plus fours and tweed jackets and deer stalkers. Splendid, splendid. Well, apply the same word here for a moment. The fruit of the earth shall be excellent, comely, splendid. There are no fruits to match or rival these fruits 
this character of our Lord, which he now reproduces within his own people. It is a spiritual fruit. It is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. It isn't merely some external kingdom. That's what they imagined. This is what they were looking forward to. You see, before our Lord came into our world, there was a transition from one kingdom to another. There were the Assyrians. There were the Babylonians. And then there were the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans. And now his own people are looking forward to getting rid of the Romans. And especially the Zealots within Judaism and the zealot with even within his own disciples were looking forward to that. So when they saw him riding into Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday, albeit on the foal of an ass, they thought, well, here comes our king. They imagined at last they were going to be rid and shot of the Romans. No, no, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's a new life principle within. It is something that he does in the heart. He infuses, he injects a new life principle. It begins with repentance towards God. It is followed quickly by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and after that with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace and so on. My dear friends, there is no fruit like this in all the world this morning. It is excellent. It is comely. It is splendid. It is glorious. It is unrivaled. It does all sorts of things for people. It enables someone to um, acknowledge they have been wrong. It enables someone to say sorry. It enables um, one to sort of get down and let other people almost make a doormat of you. Things that are alien to us by nature. There was a story told of a bridge and it's still there near my home. And it's built sort of like that and you can only walk one person at a time over it. And it shakes. It, it wasn't meant to shake, but you can shake it as you walk across it. Well, one day, two sheep met on that bridge, and they met head on. No way could they turn around. And a sheep cannot walk backwards more than three or four steps. And the farmer who was sat down on the side of the river thought, this is most interesting. And he was quite prepared to stay there for a long time. What on earth is going to happen? And to his absolute amazement, he had never seen anything like this in all his life before. One sheep got down on all fours, put its head down, and let the other one walk over it. Now that is a picture in a sense of what these fruits that are excellent and comely and splendid are able to do. They will make a man climb down from his little perch. They will deliver us from this awful love of wanting to be noticed and so on. The fruits of the Spirit, our Lord. There was something so marvelously self-effacing about our Lord as a person. There is no adornment in all the world like this. Excellent, comely, splendid. And to close, he speaks of a spiritual remnant. For them that are escaped of Israel. Now, of course, it was the cream of the Jewish society that went into Babylon. Those who conquered nations knew exactly what they were doing. And in a sense, if the activities of the Assyrian king, um, Tiglath Pileser III, which he adopted in the northern kingdom, were adopted in various parts of Europe after the First World War, there would never have been a second. What he did was this. He took the cream of that northern kingdom, the cream of society, and he took them away and planted them in Assyria. And he brought others from Assyria, which he had conquered, and put them in the northern kingdom. And so the northern kingdom became a mixture. It became a mixture of Samaritans. And the Jews in the south have no dealings with the Samaritans because they are a mixture of races and of people. Had that taken place in certain parts of Europe after the First World War, then the second one would never have taken place. But it is a remnant that is spiritual that Isaiah is looking for. Yes, the cream went into Babylon. Many of them settled down in Babylon, set up businesses in Babylon. And so Cyrus says, who is there among you that desires to return to Zion? You can go. You're free to go. And you're free to go with the gifts 
and the blessings of my people and to take back also all the treasures that were lifted by my father from, um, from Jerusalem and from the temple. And many returned, but not all. A remnant came back. And so sure was Isaiah that a remnant would return that he called his own son by a name which I can't recall now and even if I did I wouldn't try to pronounce but it means a remnant shall return. And Jeremiah who was pre-exilic and, and exilic was so convinced that a remnant would come back that he bought a field in Jerusalem and he said it is ready for use when the people return. So convinced were these men of that fact. So a remnant did return. But it is a spiritual remnant that is spoken of here. It is what's a remnant is what's left over after the rest has been taken. What is left over after a crisis situation. And Paul speaks especially of a remnant according to the election of grace. A small number left over. And in a sense that's what you and I are this morning. A remnant. We are a little number. Jesus referred to us long ago and he spoke to us in his word when he said, fear not, little flock. It's always a little flock. Oh, he is pleased to add to it from time to time down through the ages and to greatly multiply the number of believers as he is pleased and as he is wont to do. But ultimately, it is a little flock. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you worry about numbers? Please don't. Be glad this morning that you have the privilege, the enormous, immeasurable privilege of being included among that number. A little flock, a small number, when so many are passed by, seemingly. When so many do not know, when so many are in darkness, when so many are in ignorance, wonder of wonders, we were not passed by a remnant what's left over. It is a great wonder indeed that anyone goes to heaven. The greatest wonder of all, said again the great Spurgeon, is that I will be there. Do you feel like that this morning? When so many have been passed by, to us has been given the knowledge of the true God. So are we with Isaiah. Do we sit with Isaiah this morning? Do we see what Isaiah sees this morning? Do we understand, recognize what he sees and knows this morning? Do we see Christ for who he is? The one who wears our nature still. The one who came down to earth and wore it and the one who wears it still. So this again is the glory and the uniqueness of Christianity. God comes down and God takes upon him the seed of the woman not even the nature of angels says Paul in Hebrews not even the nature of angels but the seed of Abraham he is a branch that grows out of a root and then he gathers around him a people now a small number seemingly of people in the beginning it was just two disciples and then it was four then there were seven then there were twelve then there were five hundred and then there were three thousand and then there were five thousand and at last it will be a number which no man can number are you among them that's my great question are you part of this mighty army are you numbered in their ranks O oh, savior if of zion city I through grace a member am. Let the world deride or pity. I will glory in thy name and I will glory in who thou art. Because thou hast taught me that solid joys and lasting pleasures only Zion's children know. Amen. Now let's sing that hymn to close. 333, 300. And 33 glorious things of thee are spoken Zion city of our God he whose word cannot be broken form thee for his own abode on the rock of ages founded what can shake thy sure repose with salvation's walls surrounded thou mayest smile at all thy foes 333 
Father, if we are not members of Zion City, then by thy grace make us. And if we are, then grant that today and hereafter solid joys and lasting treasures may be our portion. And that being our portion, may we always glory in thy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>